Good day, good day, and welcome to another episode of Brother Reflections with you always, excuse me, I'm a little nervous right here, to be honest with you, for the first time. Good day, good day, and welcome to another episode of Brother Reflections with you as always is B.O.B. live in the Aqua Blue Lounge. I'm going to be forthcoming with everybody tonight. I'm a little nervous, you know, uh, it's a big interview, you know, it's 8 p.m. here on the East Coast as I record this, and you know, just super stoked, super excited, you know, and uh, I thought like, how am I going to start this podcast off? How am I going to like connect with the audience? So I looked deep inside myself and I, I, I thought of this story my mom used to tell me and I have a little brother, his name's Sam. Sam and I did Mongrel Mythology volume one together, a uh, documentary on the band brother. My mom used to tell us that we had another brother and his name was Ted and he lived downstairs in the basement, but we never saw him, you know? And I believed it, you know, I thought it was true, you know, like as a young kid. And as I got older, I always wondered what he was up to, you know, if I'd ever meet him, what he was thinking about and if we'd ever reunite, you know? So anytime you can get a bunch of brothers in a room together for the first time, especially in the podcast form through zoom here on brother reflections, you're going to be stoked. That's why I'm excited to, to bring to you this evening all three Richardson brothers in the same room. How are you guys? Good. Yeah. Great, so, Ted, so Ted didn't exist, but in my mind, I cared for him like he was a brother. And, you know, I, I guess, you know, like there's nothing quite like the bond between brothers growing up. And being the younger brother, Jack, I think that's my first question for you. Did they treat you okay here on Brother Reflections. No, not really. They were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just get right into it. Just tell everybody here tonight, because that's what they want to know. I mean, like, did they torment you? Because I'm an older brother, and I am guilty. Sam, I'm looking at you right now. Sorry for all the stuff I did. I'm publicly saying it right now on the, on the forum. What yeah, did they do to you to, to tease you? Oh, it's a bit of both. You know, some of the stuff up was probably not, so you can't really air it in public. Uh, <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> He was uh, definitely borderline child abuse, but uh, or uh, yeah, fratricide or frat, frat, frat abuse. But yeah. uh, no, I mean it was, it was both. Well, he was always was, willing. He was kind of he was up for yeah. anything. So he'd be a guinea pig often for for new inventions. Like, oh, okay. see, that's it. Sam was quite like that. I'd be like, okay, we're gonna make the bat cave in the closet. You're gonna be my Robin. He'd just go along for it. You know what I mean? And uh, the the bond between brothers is you know. It goes, it stretches a long way past the, this life into the next, I believe, you know, I'm familiar with the story growing up on the farm, you know, um, you know, with the Richardson brothers, like, you know, the musical talent, especially with your sister and, you know, Jack, since you're uh, the guest here tonight on uh, part one of two of brother reflections, I start listening to all your stuff. And like, I wanted to ask you too, like, you know, like, you know, growing up musically for me, I'm a big music fan and I have some guesses as to who your influence errs were and i was wondering if we could play a game and see if i got any of them right okay just say yes or no brian may yes what? <laughs> <laughs> phil collins mm, probably not i'm out i'm out so that was good i got one out of two okay <laughs> of two, but like Growing up, I mean, I always ask all the guests on, on my show, The Bobcast, like, uh, what were the posters on your wall, per se? Who did you look up to musically? Because I hear your musical style. And it, I mean, first off, you're a great guitar player. Let's just put that right here at the, the beginning of the podcast. You know, like your riffs are very, um, I was, you know, I mean, like I did the season one and you could see how I'm fan, fanboying out. I'm sorry, Hash and Angus, you know what I mean? But uh, we did the, what was the name of that uh, place, mates? The, the live concert you guys did in the early 90s? Oh, that was at the Troubadour or Club Lingerie? Club Lingerie. Yeah. Um, the guitar, yeah, the guitar yeah. was there. Out of this little, world. They had a little three camera set up there, which was pretty unusual for yeah. the day. So they, you actually did get pretty, pretty decent, you know, videos in-house yeah. video. So for me, it was great. I mean, in the, working with it in Adobe, like, you know, I had this like time, you know, vault, you know, and it sounded great through my headphones. You know what I mean? I was like, wow, like, but yeah, you shred on the guitar, man. But back to your influences. So Brian yeah. May is one, but who, who like developed your style? Because I know about the mateys, but like for you, because you have a unique voice and sound through your guitar. Well, we listened to the Beatles a lot and then the Eagles. And then 
Um, I liked all that stuff. Queen, obviously, you know, you listen to a lot. But then I loved The Police um, and then heavier stuff. Yeah, that was yeah. my number three one was The Police. <laughs> so yeah. it would have had two yeah. or three. But, yeah, I liked um, that a lot. But then I always liked, I always liked heavier stuff as well. You know, whatever role, probably not a lot of heavy metal, but, you know, hard rock, anything like that, you know, I'd listen to. Yeah, so having like a big family with a bunch of siblings, right? Like when you guys would discover music, you know, was it like the most exciting thing to come back to the, you know, the kitchen table and say, hey, guys, check out this album I just found by this band called Queen, you know? like. Yeah, I think we pretty much shared a lot of the same. I mean, I would have just listened to whatever these guys had around, um, I think, at the time. And then, I'll, I'll be honest with you, probably it didn't really expand my horizons much, personally speaking, until I was a little older. You know, in college, I think, when I started listening to a wider range of influences. Yeah, I, I think, think we... Um, that would be the same for all of us. Yeah. You know, we, we had... We listened to the, the radio a fair bit, but in terms, you know, it's not, we lived on a farm and didn't have a, I guess I can remember actually, I remember because I was listening to Queen recently and, um, and I remember that we used to watch Countdown. So each week we'd watch mm. Countdown. So we'd get a lot of fix of different, different bands from Countdown here on the ABC TV and they'd, they'd play all the video clips and have live music on. But yeah, I think, we're the same as as Jack saying that we didn't our influences didn't really expand till we hit uni, and started to get other yeah other bits of input. Yeah, there's some good Aussie bands like Midnight Oil that we got into, especially in college and Cold Chisel. But there were some re- we were just reminiscing the other night, remembering some wonderful quirky old Aussie bands that we'd listened to that are stuck in our minds, like Skyhooks and Dragon. I think I always liked heavier stuff than these guys. I could hear that in your guitar work, definitely. You know, that heavy yeah, metal I mean, influence of the, of the time period, you know. I mean, you were a teenager in, um, I get what, the late, the late 70s, right? Early 80s? Yeah, well, I would have been, uh, yeah, 80s, yeah. Early 80s. Early 80s. Yeah. yeah, what a great time for music. You know, I was born in 80s, so I mean, like, uh, I think the number one hit song when I was born was uh, Don't Stop Till You Get Enough by Michael Jackson, you know. And despite the story of whatever happened to him, I still love that song no matter what. You know what I mean? It's well, that the eighties get a bad rap sometimes, but but there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of good music. I agree. I agree. There's so many elements to it. I mean, sonically, like when you listen to it, like um, in your headphones, like through Spotify, it yeah. matches up with the same. Like uh, I'm talking out of you know the, the listeners understand. So the dBs are how it's measured and mastered in sound, and some of those songs still hold up. Some of them don't per se. You know, like. Uh, I was listening to Led Zeppelin the other day, and it's very low as compared to how loud mixes are today. Yeah, well, it depends whether you. I mean, I would I would have thought that the the Zeppelin catalog would have been remastered now, but yeah, they have. Uh, I, I just I was listening to the the, the original ones through uh, Spotify. Yeah, the original. They're back in the day when CDs first came out. A lot of stuff they just slapped it up, and then they figured out that they needed to master things differently. For, for CD quality. So now a lot of people have gone back and remastered their, their things. And so they, they're a bit louder, but, but you lose something. I mean, you do. nowadays everybody masters everything as close to zero as they can get it. So you're squishing everything down. And the, those earlier recordings had a bit more dynamics in them. Yeah. And it was well, better. I, I mean, it was better, but you can't, you know, you don't, you don't stand out on radio now or whatever people are listening to it unless you, you're as loud as everybody else. Everything's super compressed. It's kind of a shame. But yeah, it's been it that way for a while, quite a while. Yeah. You know, yeah, you just, you're just you going to get lost if you're quieter than everybody else. In a way, so, it's a shame. But you guys have a record player in your house? Is that the, the yeah. source of uh, entertainment? We did. More more tapes, though. More, more cassette tapes. Yeah, mm. Yes. We Me did. too. We Love tapes, man. Tapes were so much fun. Did you guys make mixtapes? Yeah, I yeah. did. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I remember at college, I had a big collection of tapes and they're all, you know, lined up. And then, you know, I don't know what happened to them, but. I remember lying in bed. I had mono a few times when I was in high school. And the first time I was lying in bed and I had the radio on and I had a little cassette tape in the radio and uh, men at work came on for the first time. Who can it be now? And it just <laughs> captivated me. So I'd listen to it over and over and I'd, I'd get. 
I'd record it and got a good version and I'd just listen to it all the time. And mm-hmm. of course, that I know that we'd be, you know, doing tracks on Colin's album, a solo yeah, you, album. You, you had to work, you had to work for music back in the day. If you wanted to find a song like that, you had to be, uh, you know, you had to be still enough to listen to the radio for long periods of time to hit those two buttons together, play and record. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I remember trying to record stuff off the radio and you'd get little, you'd lose a bit of the beginning or something. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then like you would be like, I wonder what that song sounds like to start with. Yeah. You know? Um, but today, I mean, obviously everything's just click, click, click. And that's probably, you know. It was just like, it's so weird to think that that's the olden days. I know, it's so weird. And like when you show, there's videos of uh, kids on YouTube like looking at cassette tapes or like pagers and not having any clue. Like there was a video I watched of a young uh, kid trying to insert a cassette tape into a Walkman, you know, and just couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, music is consumed so differently. When the Walkman came out, it was considered like, you know, revolutionary. Yeah. I remember the commercials for it very well as a young kid just being like, this is it. We're on the move. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> Future's yeah. here. Yeah. I thought like the ending was possible. Portable CD player. And that, that was. Yeah, like huge. when we used to tour, I had a, I had my little Sony Walkman, you know, the CD version, and I had, you know, the, my CDs in a little travel binder that I would take. Right. Yeah, yeah, you could yeah. take like forty or fifty CDs. We thought it was so very compact. Yeah, yeah. your little yeah. little packet of CDs. But you'd have to select, you know, what CDs CDs do I want to take on this tour? And that was know. it. That's all you had. You know, and you had to like. <laughs> Go back and forth. I remember like trying to fit the uh, CD man into my pocket and just would never, it didn't work. And I was like, man, I missed my cassette tape player. I wish I didn't go forward. You need a big pocket. A really big pocket. <laughs> like a, 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 or a sporran. Yeah. <laughs> That's what yeah. sporran's are for. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, like, you know, being a fan of music and stuff like that, uh, I was actually uh, having a chat today with Didri Drew and he shared some footage uh, today with me of uh, the year 1990 when you guys went on tour with the best and this oh, is a very did. large large group band like I was nine ten people in this band you know <laughs> yes and uh you know I, I mean i watched like this like nine minute and 53 second long uh you know just piece and uh you, you gentlemen get credit in, in the info notes of the youtube video and i just wanted to i mean i get that time in the year 1990 to be on tour with these guys and you can tell the audience who you're on tour with what was it like to just be out there doing it it was loud (laughs) (laughs) it was really loud but that was it was fun yeah it was hard who who was the band the best who was in the best i was joe walsh uh keith emerson jeff baxter um john entwistle oh, john, john entwistle those were the big guns yeah yeah and then simon phillips was the drummer yeah he's not that well known but has been around the scene a lot and the singer was just some guy from rick. canada rick yeah. yeah rick livingstone i presume yeah yeah you're a good bunch of you know all lovely Jeff people had produced his solo album that's right that's how he that's right yeah but it was fun it was a lot of fun i mean you know we were just basically doing backup vocals which is never that satisfying musically but and, yeah, and you've seen it so you've seen like some of our dance moves and stuff and yeah yeah they were good i mean <laughs> that's why we've kind of we've really tried to suppress those videos because they, they, i wasn't <laughs> going to bring it up but i mean is there any chance that we could see some tonight in the year oh, I, I sent you a clip of an earlier bot the the funniest thing is reading the comments People are like saying, you know, like things like those backup singers really creep me out. And, <laughs> and like, you know, you know, uh, boy band sort of singers, yeah. Joe, really? And <laughs> was like, what's Joe Walsh <laughs> doing with like a boy band? <laughs> I have to check the comments out. I never did that. Yeah, the, comments, the comments are well worth a visit. Yeah. So you remember um, the guy who did Addicted to Love? Yes. He had the, like, the female backup yeah, singers. Robert, like, Robert Palmer. Robert Palmer. We're like the male version of that, but... Yeah, it was amazing. We'd never been in front of audiences that size before. And to, to, to listen to these guys rehearse and, you know, we long drawn out rehearsals very much on their own timetable. And only we were in Japan and it was just a, a totally different cultural experience. Could you guys speak any Japanese at the time or did you have a guide with you to uh, help you along the way? 
Yeah, we all did this little crash course. Now we had guides. I still, <laughs> I still remember a bit of Japanese from that. Yeah, konnichiwa. Yeah, it depended how many sakis we had. I remember we. Oh came my out. God, sake! Jimmy, if, you're, if you're if you're watching Brother Reflections right now and you like the drink sake, throw up some hearts here in the the chat. What were we, we saying, um, guys? I remember the band was invited back to a nightclub in the. Um, what was that district? Rapongi. Rapongi district. They're like the red light district. And um, being on a budget, you know, we smuggled in a bottle of whiskey, not realizing that the band was there as guests and we could drink all night as much as we wanted. So I think we downed our bottle of whiskey and then um, drank free at the, at the bar the rest of the night. And I remember coming out as daylight was um, emerging on the streets of Rapongi and uh, in quite a state and having having about a 15 minute lucid conversation with about half a dozen um, teenage Japanese fellas. So at that point I could speak, I realized quite fluent Japanese. Wow. Just getting back to the backup singers. Um, I think, you know, we'd already always had our own band and we were, um, the connection was a, a, um, uh, a musician and manager in Sydney called Paul Christie who had, was going to be bringing Joe out and he happened to overhear us warming up before a gig and we were just quickly trying to learn a Christmas carol in harmony because it was Christmas time we thought oh we'll just pop out a little acapella Christmas carol. Paul Christie just happened to be walking past outside the venue heard us and said oh I'm just about to bring Joe Walsh out would you guys be interested in touring with us so we did an Australian tour with Joe and a band called the Party Boys and then Joe wanted to bring us to Japan. But as backup singers, I think we just, we had no idea what was expected. We thought we had to be entertaining. I thought you guys realize. were, I, look, I'm saying right now, I thought you guys what? were very entertaining. <laughs> just not in the right way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, it, it, it seemed to me, I mean, I saw this footage in the summertime and it seemed to me that you mates were the only ones out there having a really good time, you know, like the other guys, yeah, they were going through the motions, but you know, you guys were doing the, you know, the shakes, the twists, you know what I mean? You had the hair, you had it all. I think if somebody had just had a quiet word in there, we'd go, you guys are being hired for vocals, not for your dance moves. Yeah. That would have <laughs> steered us in a different direction. But anyway, we were definitely having fun, you know. And that was, um, you know, we've talked about that before, that, you know, we'd always had a, a goal in mind, you know, the big record deal and get signed and be rock stars. But what we realised looking back is that we did actually have lots of fun along the way and... And we ticked lots of things off the list. You know, we, um, all those things when you look back, it's just like, wow, I really appreciate that we got to do that now. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. I mean, uh, the, the footage is, uh, you know, it's interesting. Like you guys always were, you know, you grew up, you know, we, we covered um, some of that in season one of Brother Reflections of how you guys were always musical growing up. You know what I mean? There's music always around the family and, um, you know, the connection of, uh, playing together, uh, being a band and to get that chance, you know, in 1990 going out with the best, was that the first time that you guys, I mean, like you're going right out the gate and you're having fans scream like Beatle decimals at you, right? Like it was just madness up there on stage. Japan was pretty polite. I mean, they were very, Are they, they loved, loud? The audience like screaming like, yeah. Yeah. They're, they're pretty enthusiastic. Yeah, they were like, they loved it. Cause all those guys are pretty big over there. Um, so, which is often the case. And then when we done the Party Boys tour, that was a lot more smaller venue. In Japan, we were doing like little amphitheaters, so big crowds. But in Australia, it was, it was big club venues and, you know, like sweaty pub audiences. Those, those audiences were pretty enthusiastic. Yeah, they're very, they're, they love Joe in Australia. Yeah. So, I mean, like you guys get this taste in 1990, you go out there and then, you know, as we start talking about this year on uh, Brother Reflections, it's the 30th anniversary of the mates traveling across the Pacific Ocean and landing in Los Angeles in the year 1991. Was part, was part of that move influenced by going out on this tour and just be like, we just got to go, just got to go out there? I just, I think, I mean, we'd always wanted to, you know, move on to somewhere probably, but the opportunity just arose and we took it. You know, I don't think it was influenced by that, but I mean, the whole lifestyle is generally one that sort of lends itself to moving on to the next place. So when the opportunity came to get out of Australia, we, we took it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there was always the idea that 
Um, you know, Australia's got a far fewer markets. And so we had the opportunity. Our manager was working with, with Joe and Jeff Baxter, mainly Jeff Baxter. And he had a, so that's, he had an apartment in LA and he just invited us over. And so we thought, oh, you know, go to America and that, people like the Eagles, so they'll like the harmonies. It, there wasn't really a lot of thinking it through, I don't think. It was just opportunity. Well, I mean, all Australian bands, I mean, ultimately are trying to break into a bigger scene than just Australia because it's... It's a smaller market. It's a smaller market, so it's not really big enough, you know, to sustain a career over the long haul. I mean, Certainly some some, some people manage it, but but it's but it's yeah. harder. I mean, even back then, you know, you could if you had a gold record in Australia, you didn't mean you made any money. You know, so Australian brands would always be looking to, you know, break into overseas markets because they're just bigger. You know, I mean, that was always... Yeah, everybody was the Beatles. Yeah. Everybody came here to America. Even the Sex Pistols came here for yeah. a tour in 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 South America, which was just the most wildest thing you could look up on uh, YouTube. But um, yeah, I get you. I get you. You know what I mean? Like having to come here. But uh, we're all glad that you guys did in the year nineteen ninety one. Um, back to the the three part harmony. When was the first time that you guys realized that you had something special together? I mean, does it, did you have the sister participate in the, what would you call that, a quad army? <laughs> <laughs> well, then was in our high school band. Um, and back then we weren't, I don't remember doing a lot of harmonies. No, not really. We then. just weren't that sophisticated. No, no, but I think we did things like, didn't we do like Bad Moon Rising and some yeah. reading stuff where you yeah, put harmonies? But, ba but badly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, like I listen to those, the original recordings now and think, we, we, did, we didn't do any of this cool stuff. No, we, did, it was a lot of, <laughs> we didn't do a lot of the arrangements. We we're, we're very quickly early on wanting to do our own, write our own songs and, and early on our songs just weren't good. It took, took a, lot, a lot of years to get a clue. But I think we, we did, uh, just because we're brothers, our voices always blended well. And I think I, 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 think I just took it for granted. I didn't, didn't think about the fact that, that we had that as an advantage um, or that it was particularly was, unusual. A lot of the bands we listened to had that, though. Like the Beatles yeah. always had that and Queen always had it and the Eagles. I mean, so it was just like seemed like an obvious thing to do. Yeah, like we but all, we all sing, so sings, sings, you just kind of add harmonies. Do you remember yeah. the first uh, song you guys wrote that had a three-part harmony? No. I think they pretty much all did it. So yeah, so yeah, yeah, back then we, we found yeah. harmonies on pretty much everything. So I did, at some point sort of in our, when Gus and I, because you know, there's two years between Gus and me, but there's almost six years between Jack and me. So, um, I think once we hit the teenage years, um, Gus and I, um, like we had a school band as well. And, um, you know, we were just finding our feet. I mean, I could play a few guitar chords, so Gus ended up being a bass player. And then... Because you told me I had to be the bass player. Because somebody has to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyway, then um, <laughs> sort of mid-teens, we discovered Simon and Garfunkel. So I think in terms of harmonies being actually practised, you know, learning songs and doing harmonies, probably Simon and Garfunkel were the, the, yeah, that's, the earliest that's, that's, influences and Gus and I would start doing that. But then Jack, I mean, he, we went through stages where if we needed a drummer, then Jack would be the drummer. And then later if we needed, you know, a lead player, that would be Jack because he could have the ability to sort of pick up an instrument and just kind of know how to do it. Even though he denied that he was good in those days, but he had... I was, I was a bad a day, drummer. But he was a drummer. You were a drummer and that was... The, that was Originally, the I was the drummer, yeah. yeah. So I think, um, you know, yeah, Jack always had the ability to slot in, okay, we need this. So I think when it came to the three-part harmony, that's just probably maybe how it eventuated. Gus and I would, had started with two-part two vocals and then, as Jack says, we had the influence of those bands that had harmonies all the way through. So they just... It just evolved. Yeah, I don't... So when Jack finally um, finished school and went to uni in Sydney, that was our impetus to um, move the band and base it out of Sydney from Bathurst, where we grew up. And Gus and I made a pretty, pretty decent living in Bathurst during uni, playing just all around the Central West. But 
just as the US was the goal for yeah. us out of Australia, Sydney was the goal for us out of Bathurst. So as soon as Jack headed to Sydney, that was the that was the moment that the band could then base itself out of Sydney. I, and I seem to recall it sort of happening like that. Maybe we'd moved there a bit earlier or? Oh, it's, yeah, like within a year, pretty much about the time Jack started uni down there. And but you guys were still doing gigs in Sydney with Mark Fulling. That's right. Yeah. I was on my first year, first six months of yeah. uni. And then we did he, have and another great guitar player, an older guy <laughs> who played with us on lead guitar mixed us. But I suppose looking back in some respects, it was all about waiting for Jack to, to catch up and be able to do it with us. I think in the back of my mind, at least, and probably for all of us, we kind of wanted to be the next Beatles in our own way. And yeah, we were just, we were pretty much waiting for Jack to be able to join us because, you know, he was, like Ash was saying, he's, he had, he had a, a bit more of a natural musical virtuosity that, you know, I had to work for. <laughs> no, but at that stage, sort of late, I think late high school years, mate, you were, you were emerging as a, a talented lead guitarist. Yeah, so that was a really nice surprise for Hash and I to realise that. Um, that he would fill that role really well. So, Mark Fralingos got moved to um, Sound Guy. Yeah. His, uh, <laughs> on, his position in the limelight was taken by Jack. Yeah. He was a good Sound Guy. Yeah. He yeah. Was a great music. There's nothing quite like a good Sound Guy. I think a Sound Guy or a Sound Girl, there's not enough stories about them. You know, they could either be the absolute worst or the absolute best. Mm. Sound humans can be essential. Now I'm surprised at how many concerts still have bad sound. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's a that's a. I mean, I miss concerts at this point. I would gladly see a a loud. It's like winter here. It's depressing. We swap seasons all the time, and yeah. uh, I miss the You're summer. In Philly? You're in Philly. I'm in Philly. Yeah, it's. I, live, uh, I lived in Philly for a while. Did you? Yeah. Where did you live at? Down uh, in the city or outside? Yeah, well, we were in, you know, you know where Narberth is. Okay, cool, yeah. So you got chances to go see shows downtown, Trocadero and stuff like that. I mean... You know, actually, I wasn't there long enough, only six months, and I was away a lot on tour. But I always, I always enjoyed living in Philly because we were right off the train station there. So you could just... Yeah, you know, yeah. Go town and, yeah. So it's an interesting uh, segue right there because I took the tr that train that you're talking about, I took it to Temple University. Oh, yeah, yeah. Here in America, we don't call it uni. We call it college. And when I met you guys, I was like, man, why do I have to, why can't I say uni? <laughs> you know what I mean? It sounds so much better. You know what I mean? Like, it automatically sounds like there's a roster and there's, like, people having a good time. Like, my experience was, like, work and then go to school for, like, eight and a half hours and then, like, study on that train. I had some, some good times in that train, but. What's the line? What's the train line called? It's the uh... SEPTA R6 or the SEPTA R2. All of them are regional rails here in Philadelphia, the 215 to the 610. Yeah, but it goes out past, um, it's a guard past, what's the big mall out there? King of Prussia Mall? King of Prussia, yeah. yeah. What a weird name, right? You know, King of Prussia Mall. Who is the King of Prussia? It's the second largest mall in America. Back out there, there were the, uh, one of the restaurants out there. Okay, yeah, I, I, actually, I just started, I had to uh, pick up a side gig today because uh, times are not tight, but I just, you know, like I, I, it's slow right now and what I do, it's video production and stuff like that. So I'm delivering food right now for DoorDash and I forgot how much fun it is to work with, to be around people you don't know. It actually produces oxytocin in your brain, which is this chemical that makes you actually physically feel good. Like we want to be around people. And today was the first day in a long time I worked. So I'm sharing that and reflecting tonight that I, my brain is full of oxytocin right now. <laughs> well, being around these guys makes me feel good. And we haven't had many, many moments over the last few um, decade or so where we have been around each other a lot. And um, I was just standing on the beach yesterday with these guys and we we're having a little coffee on the beach after our surf, after our morning surf. And... Um, yeah, I suppose, you know, like we've talked, like any relationship, you know, there were lots of ups and downs and lots of challenges, but just standing there looking at these guys yesterday on the beach, just like, wow, you know, we, we go back a long way. And when you pause to think, you know, for me, there's lots of, lots of really quirky, amazing, great memories. And um, yeah, it's so, 
well, thanks to you, Bob, you know, the reflections has given, given us time, certainly Gus and me, to explore some of those. But when you talk about uni being really fun and memories from that time, well, you know, it sounds like uni was really fun for Gus and me, but I think um, I remember when Burr went to Sydney Uni and, um, and in a way, I think we maybe stole a bit of um, Jack's uni experience because as soon as he hit Sydney, he was... We were working a lot of nights a week um, as a band. You know, yeah, we had a couple of residencies. Yeah. yeah. And I think, so when Jack was at high school, he was a very, a bit, he was a representative rugby player. And um, so in a way, I feel like, you know, for me, rugby was huge at uni. And I got to do that and Gus did, but we kind of stole that in a way from <laughs> Jack because we actually ended up, we were working yeah, sorry, mate. a few nights a week and... So Jack probably missed out on a lot of uni parties and a lot of that uni sport and um, stuff. Sacrificed that to um, to pursue the dream that we for all for the share. good of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> I know yeah. the, the universe wouldn't be uh, complete right now without the the introduction to brother in the United States of America in the year nineteen ninety one. Say Jack's also he's uh, he's blessed with a better memory than me too. Like Ash was talking about all the quirky memories is just been reflecting on a lot of things over the last, you know, couple of weeks we've been here and you know, it's, it's always good to have things, be reminded of things that you totally forgot. And yeah. Jack's good at that. Well, I'm interested in Jack's, if I may sit in your chair for a sec, Bob, I'm interested in Jack's sort of memories of, of what it was actually like when we packed up and headed pretty, pretty without much of a clue to America, what those early days were like. Well, I remember, and we were just a bunch of idiots. I mean, I think I think we thought, oh, no, I thought we'll go over, we'll be over here for like you know six months, and we'll we'll get rich and come back and buy a house at Avalon <laughs> Beach, and, you know, whatever. And yeah. then, I mean, we were we. I don't think we even had a clue what to expect. I remember we were thinking, well, you know, because we used to play touch football a lot. We were like, Are there, is there? Well, I wonder if there'll be like you know parks and things where we can go and play rugby. I think we just thought it was going to be an urban jungle and. Yeah, I mean, it was, but it was, the early days were pretty good, I thought, over there. I mean, it was very much a crash pad. We had basically like a mattress on the floor. We all shared almost, really. Yeah, big yeah. futon. Yeah, big futon. And so it was, you know, it was a bit bit close, I think. But, yeah, it was fun. I mean, the, the early times, the early days there was, was were really fun. A lot of sharing beds on the road, too. Yeah. <laughs> I remember just before we, we uh, came on air with you today, Bob, you know, I was saying... We were just talking about those early days when we were touring and um, we had this great, we had Bertha Brown, our big LTD Ford station wagon, which we drove into the ground, mainly just around LA doing gigs around there. And then we got a dolly, short, named Dolores for a short while until these guys discovered that Dolores means misery. So yeah. they renamed it dolly. <laughs> so we toured in this, this big van. Um, but I was remembering those days and two to a bed and I was saying, oh, that was so fun. And, Jack was saying, uh, actually, I just remember them being uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. So you're six years yeah. young, uh, younger than them. So how old were you when you came to America in 91? Oh, I was 22, I think. Yeah. Oh, what a perfect age to come to America at. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like 22 years old. The other yeah. guys in the band are a little bit older. They're steering the ship. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd, I'd sign up for that trip, man. It'd be great. Um, we, had some, we had some good times for sure. Yeah. I remember the. Uh, I, we, we used to like, we used to rehearse in our apartment. I don't even know how we did it. Yeah, I mean, not full bore, but I mean, it was definitely loud. Drum yeah. kits set up, drum sets in the middle of the <laughs> living room. Living room. Yeah. I, we must have had super tolerant neighbours because, like, if it was me, I'd just, I'd be like so pissed off. Yeah. But we just up. play for hours in there, and yep. sort of it, we had pretty big parties in there that would go all night and all that sort of thing. And yeah, I think we just got, we were lucky. We had I think we had a couple of stoned guys that lived above. And then a young, younger kind of couple that maybe didn't mind partying stuff that were on the one side. So yeah, it kind of worked out. What part of LA was this? Glendale. Nice. I lived in the Los Feliz Lake type Silver Lake area. Mm-hmm. I lived in a warehouse also on a, well, actually I had an air mattress inside of a tent. I was a little bit more advanced <laughs> when it came to being a, a struggling musician. Yeah, we didn't think we didn't think too much about those possibilities in the early days. It was yeah. I, I was the only one that had privacy. 
You know, everybody else, like, I, I was the only one who's like, oh, yeah, come back. I got a room, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> come in my tent. There was a sign in our window of our apartment that said, do not feed the musicians. <laughs> yeah, didn't you take it? Wasn't it in the Park La Brea apartment? Uh, you oh, have one like it? Well, we had it in the Glendale one, I remember that. Yeah, mm. very apropos. Well, uh, we're going to do two, two parts, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, tune in next week. For another episode of Brother Reflections, we're going to dive deeper into the mythology of Brother in the mid '90s. Uh, fellas, thanks again. Nice to meet you, Bob. Always a pleasure, Bobby. Thank you, everybody. Gotta live a life. Three handsome guys over there. They're not married. First time in Japan, so. Home. Angus, Fergus, and Haven. Ladies and gentlemen, the brothers. From Australia, what a story, what a concept. <laughs>